know that yesterday I was so grateful that it was windy, which I really, really can't stand the wind, I have to tell you, because I can't get out to the barn and it's irritating. And, but I was so grateful because I was, I was in my cozies, you know, my, my little, my, we all know what those are, not, not always for public consumption, um, but I was all cozied up and it was like, Time stood still, sometimes in an agonizing way, because the Lord had me really delve into, and I pray, there's a thought, let's pray. Um, really and truly, I really pray, Father God, what you walked me through yesterday, Lord God, let it not be watered down today, Father God, that the ladies here today could hear from you as I heard from you, that I would be completely out of the way, Lord God, and your spirit would pour forth to every single woman here today. In your precious name, Jesus, amen. Because what I, I, I want to start by saying this isn't just, a, this isn't a fairy tale. This isn't some story to add a little color to the word of God. God doesn't need color. He is color. So this is real. And I'm going to do my very, very best to impart that to you. So we want to go back. We've got to revisit a little bit. And there is a lot to cover because it's too it's two lessons I'm trying to work through here, and God's just going to have to do whatever he's going to do. Um, it's important for us to see what led David to flee fra, uh, to Philistine and to the Philistines. The Philistines kind of represent the world to us, really. You know, David only looked at the crushing circumstances closing in around him. And the result, it set his feet in this downward spiral and a path of self-destruction. Instead of faith in God, David was going by the apparent facts that led to much fear. Then foreboding, then fantasy, and finally failure before God and man. It's important. God kept me here for a long time. How does this happen? Because it's not just David, is it, ladies? It's not just David. There's facts, right? There's facts as they appear to our senses and our minds. Fears that begin to arise out of our emotion. Foreboding based on the foregoing facts. Fantasies, which are false and deceptive imaginations, and failure to do God's will or act in faith. This is an ominous process constantly at work in the lives of God's people. It's especially true for modern Christians who are we're conditioned by humanistic culture and scientific education to base all decisions on fact-finding. Now follow me here for a minute. I'm, you'll see how this is going to tie in. Because all such data processing is determined by our five fallible human senses and makes no provision for the exercise of spiritual insights or quiet faith in Christ. This is where we get into trouble in Christ to overcome the apparent difficulties which confront us as God's people. So let's see where David is. In desperation, when we get desperate and we don't go before the Lord, we do desperate things. That is our instinct. That is our nature, our physical, fleshly nature. He came to what seemed like a great idea. It's a great plan in his own eyes. Remember, David was getting weary. He's been battling a madman. He's been running. He hasn't been staying at the Four Seasons going, gee, I hope Saul doesn't knock on my door. He hasn't even been staying in his own cushy home like we do. 
with the heat turned up and our little comforter wrapped around us. He was running in a barren wilderness with a band of disgruntled warriors from place to place to place to place to place. Now remember, David, way deep inside, knew his destiny. Let's not forget that. But David uses his own wisdom, his own plan, his own will. And isn't this so like Satan? It looks good for a while. It works, doesn't it? It works. What a brilliant plan. Genius. Go to the Philistines. David surely, I mean, Saul surely isn't going to go there. Relief. What do we want? Immediate relief from the trials, especially when it's ongoing month after month, year after year. We want relief. David, then it hits the wall, doesn't it? And as I shared in group, God had me feel, I don't know how to describe this to you, when the Philistines recognized David, and he was standing next to Achish, the traitor. And they said, that's David. And Achish said, no, no, this is, he's not doing anything wrong. He's, in fact, David, my buddy, oh, his skin must have been crawling. I'm going to make you my, my chief guy. Oh, that was the Lord saying to David, Gotcha. Here we go, David. Are you ready to start walking through the consequences of not seeking me? I must have stayed, and I'm not exaggerating, on my face in my kitchen, remembering all of the times I have done that in my life and what it cost not only me, but my family, my loved ones, my friends, my walk with the Lord. I was literally ill yesterday, feeling what David had created. Because once you start that lie, once you start that story, you have, to keep, you have to keep making it go, don't you? And there he was. David loses everything that was dear to him and his men. Women and children taken, homes and villages burned. I don't think any of us have come to that point. I don't know, maybe there's someone in this room who has, who've lost your children, who've lost, and your house is burned down. Yet, in his brokenness, with men ready to stone him, he's the leader. He's the leader. Who do you want to stone? The leader. He cried out to the Lord. He reached the point of brokenness. He began. He cried out to the Lord. And I want you to catch this. God was waiting to help. Take this to heart. When we are weak, how do we strengthen ourselves? How do we strengthen ourselves? There's two parts to this. David strengthened himself in the Lord, then he obeyed. Why is that necessary? Pretty hard to obey if you're in your flesh. So what's the first thing? If you're in your flesh and you've disobeyed and you're weak and you can't go on, you strengthen yourself in the Lord. I strengthen myself in the Lord, and then listen, and then obey, because you've got the Lord in you now. This is what David did. Let's turn in your Bibles a minute to Psalm 27, 14. Psalm 27, 14. Take this to heart. This comes out of David's experience. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, 
on the Lord. Satan says, run, be fearful, be terrified. There's everything around you. It's going to get you. Your life is crumbling. Nobody's around. God doesn't hear you. You don't have money. You don't, your child is sick. The doctor gave you a bad report. Quick, be terrified. What, is, what does God say? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your what? Our hearts. The condition of our heart is what comes out of our mouth. Let's turn to Isaiah 40, 31. This is such a beautiful piece of scripture, and it's so encouraging. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Burn that in your heart. We are in times where that needs to be part of our cellular structure. We need to know this. Psalm 73, 21 through 28. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant, I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Do you see what David always does? He tells the truth. My heart was grieved. I was messed up, tortured in my mind. Stop being a phony. Tell the truth of where you're at to the Lord. I was foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast. But then, what does David say? Nevertheless, even though I'm, I, I did all this, I am continually with you. That's where we have to be. That's where we have to be. And then what does he tell? The, he tells the character of God always. You, are, you hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel. We have to speak these things out loud, ladies to break through bondages, to break through trials. Speak them out loud in your house. Walk through with this Bible open from room to room. It's powerful. And afterwards, receive me to glory. That's the truth. That's the truth. And David speaks the truth. So now as we continue in Samuel... How does God let this unfold? Because what's really unfolding here? It's the refining of David to lead a nation. That's what's unfolding. It's, it's, it's bit by bit. So now what happens with David? The Philistines fiercely pursue Saul and his sons, and beloved Jonathan is killed. Have you ever lost your best friend? Saul is severely wounded. He begs for his armor bearer to kill him, but he refuses. So Saul falls on his sword. Is he killed by his own hand? Not quite. This gets dragged out just a little bit more. The Amalekite had to finish him off, and God protected David because David was far from the scene. Isn't that amazing? David couldn't be connected with anything that went wrong with Saul's family or Saul. That's amazing. 
He was far from this scene. They all died together in Saul's camp. Saul's death finally frees David. He is anointed king over Judah in the south. He still had to wait seven and a half years before he got to be king of northern Israel as well. David's response is staggering to me. He rips his clothes, weeps, then asks the Amalekite, how dare he put his hand on the Lord's anointed Saul. I have to stop here. I was stopped there for two hours yesterday. And God worked that through in me and worked it through and worked it through and worked it through. Keep in mind, ladies, David already knew his destiny. Keep in mind he was hunted down by this demonic, psychotic king. And what does he do with his first response? He weeps. And then what does he do? How dare you put a hand on God's anointed? That's the point. Don't lose this point. It is critical. No matter what terror David went through, God never told David to harm. I mean, yeah, God, God never told David to raise a hand against Saul, did he? But do you see why David was a man after God's own heart and not his own? You've got to grasp that. You've got to really grasp that. The reason David, there were many reasons, but the reason David was a man after God's own heart is that through all of this, he's justified in saying, Hallelujah, Saul's dead man, let's bury him, get his head on a stake, get his son's head. He has terrorized my family. He has spoken against God. He has terrorized Israel. But what does he say? How dare you harm? What is important to David? God's anointed. So what's important? God's agenda. This is what we have to get. That's why God ground me for two hours yesterday. Not my agenda. Not your agenda. Not what seems fair. Not what seems right. But God's agenda. That's what David grasped onto. That's the power. And he never lost sight of it. He didn't say, yeah, well, okay, I guess it's the Christian thing to do. You know, I'll... I'll I'll kind of be, you know, eh, wish he was dead. It was real. He so loved the Lord. He so had reverential fear. Pastor Derek spoke Sunday, and I thought it was so powerful that this, 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 this lightness about the Lord, you know, my buddy, makes me, makes me sick to my stomach. He's the almighty God. He's the almighty God, the creator of the universe. David had that reverential fear. What God says, I quake. What God does, I honor. In spite of my justification that this man has tormented me. That's huge. How does one do that? By dying to self. That's how one does it. It's finally saying, God, your agenda is more important than my agenda. Why is it so hard for us to do that? Because of the flesh. Because of lack of faith. Because of lack of trust. For so many reasons. So, still knowing his destiny in all humility, he goes and inquires of the Lord. Shall I go to any of the cities in Judah? How humble. Where should I go, Lord? Where? The Lord tells him to go to Hebron. What would your reaction be? Now was his time. His destiny designed by the Lord, prophesied by Samuel. He earned it, don't you think? 
hiding like a wild animal from the wickedness of Saul. This was unjust. It was unfair. He was a shepherd boy, minding his own business. He didn't ask to be king. He didn't seek glory and fame and name and power. He was minding his own business until Samuel showed up and said, yep, you're the one. He was a shepherd boy who loved the Lord. He didn't ask for this. For those of us sitting there going, this is not fair. I'm doing the right thing. I didn't ask for these trials. Hold on to that. He fought battle after battle. Even in his mistakes and sin, he truly repented, glorified the Lord, and sought him in humility. Now was David's time. My vision would be finally, okay? Finally, Lord, okay. I mean, my vision would be all of Israel would immediately unite and humbly prostrate before them, before David, mighty warrior, wise, honorable, loyal man of God. That would have been my vision. Like, you know, all's good now. Everyone in Israel should just, I'm king. I did my duty to God and my country. And, you know, that's it. All unite and bow before me. That's not what happened, is it? You will see that this week. It was David's time. But God, and this is, this is encouragement, so hang on to this. He allows circumstances to work it through to our bone marrow. God is not a patcher-upper, not a quick fixer. He allows these circumstances, especially for leaders. You can't lead what you haven't walked through. Because what happens as a leader, there's more responsibility. There's more responsibility because we can lead people astray. God forbid. God forbid that ever happen. So there's more accountability. That's why it says in the word, be careful when you ask if you want to be a teacher. <laughs> You know, that's a calling and just be on your face. That's all I can say about that. So for a leader, and especially a leader of a country, he had, to get, he had to get to David's bone marrow. So God allowed this process, and we continue to read in 2 Samuel, we see David give the spoils of war to all, to all. Did he hoard it all for himself, thinking, man, did I pay living in zip? You know, I was in zip for a long time, and now I've got all the spoils. I am going to live it up. No, he did not. He gave. What was David doing? David was forging bonds of love, devotion, and loyalty with the common people that would stand him in good stead. This is a mark of good leadership. Meet people where they're at. Serve. Fellowship. Love. Have compassion. Have mercy. Listen. That's what David was doing. His future was being grounded in goodwill, love, and genuine gratitude. But now, what meets David? We're not done, are we? The house and armies of Saul and northern Israel, the children of Benjamin, pursue him and his army. What? Really? I was going, really, Lord? Again? Really? Don't you have that happen? Don't we have that happen in our lives? We just make it through. We go, okay, Lord, I heard you. I, I, I repent. I'm going to do better over here. And you get that one nostril above the water line. Yeah, I know you ladies know this. One nostril, you're going, okay, okay. So Tommy was in the principal's office, and he's not getting suspended. Whew. Okay, my husband did actually work those extra overtime hours. The car payment's going in. Okay, honey, the hot water heater broke. I've got the flu, and little Tommy's in the principal's office yet again. You're going, 
really, Lord? I mean, seriously? Like, but didn't I have all the dots connected? And the Lord, I just know, says, but I want to move you to higher ground. See? It's not the Lord saying, this, here you go again, more trials. That's not our God. That's the world. That's our sick minds. That's the pity party. And I've been there going, Lord, really? Really? Can you, can you give me that feeling of the higher ground thing happening a little bit? But that's what he wants to do. That's the desire of his heart. He loves us so much. He sees us as shining spiritual beings. So he says, come on, you made it through this. Come on, stretch a little more. You can do it. So your husband was a little cranky. Get over yourself. You know, so he says those jeans didn't quite look as slimming as you thought they might have looked. Okay? All right? Men, you know, they don't always notice those things. Okay? Ask your girlfriend. She'll tell you you look great. Right? I mean, you know, it's okay. It's okay. I mean, I, I said to my husband the other day, and he's real quiet, real sweet. You know, I can have that house like spick and span. My husband, he'll say, um, Oh, the grout, did the grout get cleaned? And he doesn't mean it. It's just his, his nature of seeing details. And you know, I want to just hand him a brush, but I do not. And say, read the directions on the grout cleaner, have at it. But you know, that's just his, so I just kind of smile and say, oh, okay. You know, and walk away and pray and wait, and it's okay. It, in that process, Instead of reacting to that, you really grow spiritually. It sounds like a little thing, but a hunk of flesh just goes. See? It's true. It's true. So that's the heart of our Lord. He wants to grow us. We have to be encouraged by that. This is not a worldly process we're in, ladies. We're not out in the world. We're in the world, but not of the world. So the things that seem unfair, and you see your sister with her Mercedes, and her kids never get sick, and they're on a roll, and she's spiritually vacant. Pray for her. Don't envy her. Pray for her. Spiritually bankrupt, serious weeping and gnashing of teeth if that person doesn't come to the Lord. Serious. Eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. So, there's David. I'm not sure when this psalm was written, but I, in my mind... <laughs> I kind of think David kind of had this ruin going, how long, oh Lord, how long? I mean, you know, that really, the tribes of Benjamin are now coming after me? How long, oh Lord, how long? And I tell you, there's only one answer to that. Do you know what it is? When God's ready. All right, so let's just, let's just get that answered right now. When God, when, when he says so. Any questions? Save yourself the time. Keep praying when he says so. He's the boss. That's it. That's it. It didn't just get resolved. It didn't just unfold. Scratching and clawing through every trial, David grew stronger and stronger, digging in to what he was really made of and growing in the Lord. It's the relationship. That's it. It's the relationship. I mean, we're talking about God Almighty. You cannot have a fruitful life if you have a superficial relationship with God. You know what the superficial relationship? Oh, there's problems. I'm going to pray now. Please heal me. Deliver me out of this trial. That's a superficial relationship. Where are you day to day? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, I can turn on the water and it's hot. And maybe some of you need to go on a missions trip. Because I still, I wasn't a Christian then, but I do not forget what it was like to live in India. I will never forget. Not, you don't have hot water. You don't have clean water. You can't eat things. You can't even breathe the air sometimes and not get sick. So I still have that very much in my being. We need to be grateful. 
The house of Saul grows weaker and weaker in stages. Do you see things don't just happen immediately? Did it ever say in the word and say, well, Saul's family was wiped out. David was made king. Never did David ever have a problem ever again. Prophecy, prophecy fulfilled. Isn't that what we want sometimes? We hear from the Lord. We know. We believe. But we want it, we want it fulfilled now. Okay, let's see it, Lord. Let's go. Doesn't work that way because something has to be done in us. That's what matters to God, not the end result. Abner, I mean, it doesn't end, does it? Abner, whom David made a covenant with and he trusted, Joab kills. David curses Joab. Again, here we go. They bring the news that Saul's son, Ishbosheth, has been killed. What is David's reaction? Anger and distress. Why? God's anointed. I mean, I mean, it had to be running through David's mind. Wow, Saul's gone, but you know, I hope all the others are gone too, because if Saul's sons rise up, I'm going to have this problem forever and ever and ever. But it didn't. Again, his same reaction. He did. Did do you think David loved Ishbosheth? I don't think it was love. I think it was his love of God, that God said, "My hands anointed these people." That's where the love was. So, do you see how you can translate that? You don't have to feel warm and fuzzy about someone. You do not. You just have to be obedient. You don't have to say, that's my, oh, I love that person. If God is working that person, you have to be respectful of what God's doing, not what your emotions are towards that person. That's none of your business, truthfully, ladies. It's none of our business. We have to respect what God is doing. Tough lesson. Finally, in chapter 5, 2 Samuel, after grieving Saul and Jonathan, at age 30, he is made king. All the tribes of Israel unite. I'm getting all the Jews together. I can tell you just in my, that's a miracle right there. I'm serious. I mean, that's a miracle. And what did they say? We are your bone and your flesh, David. That's what they say to David. While he waited, he struggled, but he continued to grow and serve God. Ladies, this is the secret to waiting. We've talked about this before. Waiting is not a passive thing. Of, I'm waiting on the Lord. I sure hope I become more spiritual one day. I'm just waiting. I don't have a job, but I'm not looking because... God, you'll provide me with one. My children are disobedient, but I'm waiting for you to correct them. No. Just saying. David continued to serve in the midst of his waiting for prophecy to be fulfilled. It's the secret of our lives. It, whether it's waiting for God's promises or prophecy or prayers to be answered. He waited 20 years. I sat there for quite a while. He waited 20 years for that prophecy. We're so impatient. And I'm right at the top of that list. That's why God always gives me these things to be patient about, because he's growing my patience. And I am far more patient than I was in my 30s. That was not pretty. I've learned through trials to be patient. He waited. He waited 20 years. Let's turn a minute. Well, wait before we turn. God's provision and plan all along was to grow David. That was his, that was his plan. When David sang, and you'll see in the study this week, that song of mourning for the loss of his friend Jonathan, 
that beautiful song of mourning. He loved it. He loved Jonathan more than anyone. And I was thinking, oh, Lord, couldn't you have spared his best friend? I mean, that was his best friend. But the Lord had a reason. That's all. It's God. You can't question it. We'll never know why Jonathan had to, had to be taken. But what a heartbreak for David. What a personal heartbreak. He had reverent respect for Saul, but the gracious spirit of God resided in him. There came to David truth out of the dark moments, truth from the Most High, not only truth amid tragedy, but also counsel in the midst of calamity and direction in the midst of disarray. That's our God. He didn't just leave David. Say, good luck. Hope it all works out for you. Sometimes we feel that way, don't we? Because we can't see. We can't see the fruit yet. We can't see the victory yet. But there is victory going on in the spiritual realm. See, that's the, here we are, and this is the fifth. Right now, right here, in that spiritual realm, are angels, warriors, Jesus, the Lord, Abba Father, right here, right where we sit. We just can't see it. Our prayers go up like incense. Spiritual battles are being fought right as we speak in everybody's life here that's praying for that. It's not inactive. It's not God saying, well, I'm waiting for you to come to heaven one day. No, that's not how it is. Battles are going on for us ladies and our families and our loved ones. God is always like that. He is the God of all comfort. He is the God of all comfort. He is the God of all consolation and counsel. He is the God of all compensation in our crisis. God preserved David for the great and noble purposes he had been anointed to perform. God's plan, God's will be done. God's will be done. You can never go wrong praying for God's will. You know, sometimes don't you feel, there's so many, you don't know what to pray, how to pray, which way. Pray for God's will. You can never go wrong. He's perfect. You're not sure how to pray? Just pray, God, let your will be done. I'm not sure how to pray for my son or daughter or husband, but Lord, if it's your will, that's all we need. That's all we need. Doesn't have to be a complicated, long-winded prayer. Just, God, your will be in my life. Can't go wrong with that. Can't go wrong with it. No matter what that is. But you know why we fear praying that? I remember for years, like 25 years ago, I was so afraid to pray that. Well, I don't know what God's will is. Imagine what an idiot. I mean, duh. I mean, you mean, how dark was my mind? You know, I, well, I, I'm not sure what God, you know, I, he didn't tell me what his will is. I'm not sure I want to pray for his will. What if his will is I'm feeding goats in, uh, in, in Bombay? That's not happening. I mean, I'm not going there again. You're not getting me to a third world country, not in this lifetime. I mean, what, what if that would be God's will? I mean, that, hmm. Well, that's the truth. God had to show me his character. I had to develop a relationship through many serious trials to know why would I want to be in anything but God's will? I'm so pathetic. Anything I could come up with is so pathetic compared to his. And he let me have my plans. Oh, yeah. He let me have my plans and the consequences that went with them. Yes, ma'am. He did. Go for it, Gail. You're so smart. You do it. Let's see how that works out for you. Went around that mountain a few times, but that's how you get to that place. See, we all get there a different way. You have to go through that struggle, but God is always there. That's the amazing thing. We're complete idiots. We're fools. And he still loves us and is still there anytime. Anytime. All we have to do is ask. All we have to do is come in all humility. 
He's there. There's nothing else like that in the entire universe. Nothing like our Jesus. There's no place that can fill that place in us but Jesus. We have a few minutes. Turn in your Bible to Psalm 37, please. Now, I know this is a long psalm, but I'm hoping that as we read it out loud, it will pierce your hearts. Psalm 37. Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass, and he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. It's like the woman I said with the Mercedes, okay? Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass, cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. How many times must we hear that until we stop wringing our hands in anxiety? Does it ever solve anything, I ask myself? Does it ever solve anything? All it does is keep our, gets our eyes off of the Lord and rob our energy. It has a physical effect on the body and mind. It creates a chemical in the brain, which causes more anxiety, depletes your breathing, causes your heart muscle to contract, your blood flow doesn't go to the brain, then you make wrong decisions. That's what fretting does. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth, the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bow to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart. Wow. And their bow bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. Skip down to 39. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength. He is our strength in the time of trouble. Are we in the time of trouble? Yes, we are. And the Lord shall help us and deliver us. He shall deliver us from the wicked. He shall save us because we trust in him. Let's pray. Oh, Father God, Abba, Father, 
You are so gracious and merciful, so patient, Lord. We thank you, Father God. We thank you for your love and your mercies are new every day. Father, lift our burdens, Lord God. Grow us in strength that we are women after God's own heart. Oh, Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit that we may see your glory and marvel at the splendor of your spirit, Lord Jesus. Father God, you are God Almighty. You are the creator of the universe. Heal our wounds, Lord God, and let us keep our eyes fixed on you. Heal our broken hearts, Lord God. Be gentle, Lord, as we go through this life. Strengthen us, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you. Thank you for your son, Jesus.